Okay, so, um, well, you kind of saw how it worked more in, in real life. but um, So that's the first type of sample we collect. And it's, it's sometimes referred to uh, the category of bottom hole samples, okay, because it is collected at the bottom of the hole in the reservoir. So this is what I would refer to as, uh, as a, a bottom hole sample. But you have to realize that it is of the type open hole formation. Because historically, we have collected bottom hole samples that we call bottom hole samples in a completely different way. Okay, and that's the second time of type of sample that I'm going to talk about, the conventional bottom hole sample. So we'll keep the same sketch here, and what we're going to do now is run production casing. So basically we're going to run this pipe into the hole. Well, I'll tell you what, mm, yeah, we can do it on the other side. Of, the, of course, we had to take out the tool first, right? You know, <laughs> otherwise we'd lose a lot of money. They're expensive tools. So this is our production casing. A so-called cased well now, okay? And we put cement, that's cement, depending how deep the well is, this is cement between the rock and the casing. Um, if it's a shallower well, then we may run the cement all the way to the surface, um, but uh, often the wells are so deep that you only run the cement up a certain uh, distance. And then in order to produce the well, we have to shoot holes through the casing, the pipe, through the cement, and into the rock. So I'm going to, you know, basically put perforations. You basically take a gun and you shoot these holes. They're not bigger than a half an inch, you know, a centimeter or, or two, the most. And then uh, the distance it goes in may only be, you know, a meter or less than a meter, um, small holes. And you have maybe one of these every foot, or you might have four of these every foot. You might have them all in the same direction, or you might have one this way, one into my head, one over to the right, and one towards you every foot. Okay? So you have different configurations. But typically you have somewhere between two and six of these holes for every foot. Those are called perforations. And then you got to, I'm just going to sketch a couple of them because, you know, there's so many of them. And then, uh, basically, once you get all of these in there, you can turn the well on at the surface. You probably have production tubing as well, running inside here. More pipe. Probably have what's called packer which basically seals off the production tubing from the casing okay. and then this production tubing will go to some kind of a production separator, which I've been drawing in this kind of notation. And the production tubing will typically be anywhere from two and three, three eighths. This is standard in the United States for 98% of the wells uh, in outer diameter. Okay. Whereas in Norway, you might have seven inch production tubing. 
sometimes in really big wells, nine inch, nine and five eighths inch production tubing, but typically seven inch, five and a half to seven inch production tubing offshore. You can go as high as seven inch, nine and five eighths, which is basically casing, um, but they use it for big production wells. And there's a few fields in the world that apparently are using like I think 11 to 13 inch. I mean, in Australia, at least they considered some of these really big prolific gas reservoirs. So, but typically this is the upper range of, of production tubing size. Okay, so then you basically control the well. You've got all sorts of, you know, chokes and, you know, and you can open the well, close the well from here. And if, it, if it's producing, uh, then of course you'll start producing gas and this would be separator oil, maybe also some water would be produced, and separator gas. So there'd be some interface here, equilibrium whatever the separator pressure might be. It could be anywhere from 10 bar to 100 bar. Anywhere from 10 degrees C to 50, 60 degrees C. Depends, you know, kind of what the ambient temperature is and the reservoir temperature. So now we're doing a, an actual production test. And when we're doing this actual production test, then we can collect the other two types of samples that I'm going to tell you about. Okay. okay. So the second, this is during production testing, case told. It's usually cased whole. I mean, there could be a production test in what's called a drill stem test before they put the casing in, where they actually flow gas and oil to the surface uh, without the casing. But it's not, it's not common, so much common. So during a cased whole production test. And this case to production test, of course, will be flowing part of the time. Part of the time it'll be shut in. So it might be flowing, but it also might be shut in. So the second kind of sampling is called a wire line. Okay, inside the casing, they run in the casing, they run maybe even through the tubing. They run a wire line with a tool on the bottom of it, and it's got a sampler at, at the bottom. So it's a very, uh, it's much simpler than the MDT tool. It doesn't have a lot of electronics and pumps and things. It's just a, it's kind of a tool that's got some electronics. It's called a wire line bottom hole sampler. And it'll typically be located close to the perforations. Maybe just above, possibly just below, but typically somewhat above the perforations. At or above the perfs. Then the well is going to be flowing for some time to get reservoir fluid in. And so they may open the sampler and collect fluid into the sampler while the well is flowing during flow.
or they might actually shut the well in if it's a uh, you know, uh, during a shut-in. This kind of sample is quite similar in terms of the, what it's containing to the MDT type sample. But there's an important difference between the two. The MDT sampler is, select, is, is sampling at a given depth. It's a very limited, it's basically at this depth, you know, maybe plus minus one meter to, the, to that little production test to where the nose touches the rock. A very local composition. Whereas in a production test, you might have perforations, I can make this, you might have perforations over an interval, for example, that might be two meters, it might be 20 meters, it could even be more than 100 meters. Thick. So it's going to be some average of that interval. Okay? It's going to be some average of the composition in that interval. Okay. So basically I'm going to say this is going to be kind of an average sample. over the perforated interval. Whereas the MDT type sample up here, I'm going to call it a depth specific sample. Okay. And there are some reservoirs, not least in Norway and Gulf of Mexico and other places, where the variation from meter to meter can be significant in what it is, being a gas, an oil, a changing oil, a changing gas. In other words, the composition of the reservoir fluid may vary substantially with depth. And if you need to know that information about how it varies with depth, then really the MDT open hole formation type tester is the only way to find out that information. Okay? Do you have to clean the well the Yeah, when you start the production test, the mud will come out quickly, yeah, hopefully, if the well is producing reasonable rates. So be, it's called a cleanup period. Typically, they'll flow it at relatively high rates. Of course, it's a heavy column of fluid, but they'll try to get that out as quickly as possible. They'll have a high rate where they try to clean out all of that, both from in the well bore and around, around the formation. Around the perforations, you probably have some of this gunk, uh, this mud, you know. So they'll try to, to produce some of this, you know, get that mud out so that you're producing a clean, reservoir fluid. Might take 30 minutes, an hour. That flow period initially is typically six hours to 12 hours. And then only after that will you start taking uh, running samplers. So that's a good question. Okay, now I know we're at the break time. We already had a little break. But any other question before we take a next break? Or if you don't want to have a break, you know, it's good for me. I, you know. Yeah, we'll take a break. Ten minute, ten, break, ten minute break about. Okay. Right, so this, uh, this second type of uh, bottom hole sample um, we'll come back to, but a another important difference between the MDT type sample uh, formation, open hole formation testing sample, and the 
wireline bottom hole samplers that this sampler is basically only uh, rec recommended or used um, I'll say recommended um, because sometimes companies will will actually use this method but it's only recommended for what we will call oil reservoirs okay reservoirs that are you know, single phase oil um, and the reason for that is when you're uh, particularly if it's shut in the well or even flowing at a low rate if you get two phases in this in this uh, part of the reservoir in, in part of the well bore here um, exactly how to to mark it but uh, in this in this part in particular down here um, you're, if the well's shut in or if the well's flowing at a low rate, which it often is during this type of sampling, and it goes into two phases, then these two phases will typically segregate because of gravity effects. And the sampler may collect too much gas or too much oil. In other words, it won't be single phase at the bottom of the well. And if it is two phase because of these gravity segregation effects near the sampler, there's a, a relatively high risk that um, that the sample may not be representative of what actually flowed in from the reservoir. Okay. Whereas the the MDT, the open hole formation test sampler, it doesn't matter. It can flow whatever fluids into it. There's no gravity effects going on in connection between where the the fluid flows in and it flo flows directly into the sampler so it doesn't really matter if it's an oil or a gas so that's um, that's a, a fundamental difference so uh, I'll just make a note that whereas the um, open hole formation bottom hole sample um, can be really any kind of reservoir fluid. Namely, oil or gas, gas condensate. Okay, I think that summarizes um, the second type of sample. Uh, and the third is also during case hole production testing. And in that case, the uh, well must be flowing. And this is referred to as a separator sample. So I'm going to put our production tubing here again, entering this production test separator. And we basically are taking uh, gas from top of the separator and um, you may have water and or oil coming out of the um, uh, the bottom of the separator I'm just gonna I'm just gonna indicate it as if it was only oil coming out we're gonna ignore the, the water part so what we're going to do here is take um, samples coming off of the separator. So basically, we've got our separator oil and our separator gas. 
and uh, this is at some separator pressure and temperature and these are important to to know that pressure and temperature these are important things to know at the time of sampling so you've got this gas pipeline and then you've got basically a meter this goes through Um, and the, samp the sample in the gas is typically collected by inserting a, a thin needle um, that's pointed downstream and then that's connected to a gas bottle that's approximately 20 liters so it'll be evacuated um, and filled by this uh, separator gas. And typically we'll collect two of these samples in case something bad happens to the one, like leakage on the way being transported to the laboratory. So we'll typically collect two of these samples here. And then there's, uh, I can't really tell you the um, the mechanical mechanism for taking this sample at this point so I'm just going to make kind of a, a sample here and this sample will be collected in a just short of just less than about one liter bottle and of course these are high pressure bottles because they will be basically containing fluid at or possibly a little bit above the separator pressure and temperature. So this is our separator oil and this is our separator gas. Now at the time we take these samples, we need to know, uh, there's actually a, a meter here as well, it's a different kind of meter, it's, a, it's basically a, an orifice plate. There's a, it's, it's basically, it's a, it's a metal plate, it's got a little hole in the middle. And they slide it into, they slide it into here, so it's like, Right at this point, it's got this very small diameter compared to the gas diameter. They measure the pressure upstream and the pressure downstream to that orifice. And then based on the orifice diameter and the pressure and temperature and the two pressures across uh, upstream and downstream, uh, basically all of this information here will be converted to a mass gas rate which is then expressed as a volumetric gas rate of the separator, which I'm going to write like this, but it's going to be given in units like standard cubic meter per day or thousand standard cubic feet per day. Okay? So it converts that orifice meter into a standard gas volume, even though it's not at standard conditions right? It's just gas volumes are always reported at standard conditions. And likewise this meter here will be measuring the separator oil rate. But that w should be, it's being metered in separator barrels per day or separator cubic meters per day. And those volumetric rates are specific at the conditions of separator pressure and temperature. Okay. And then we often uh, operate with the so-called separator test gas oil ratio. 
and that would be simply equal to this separator gas rate over the separator oil rate and its units would be uh, for example standard cubic feet per separator barrel or standard cubic meters per separator cubic meter. Now it's very important to get the measurement of the separator gas oil ratio because in order to find out what we really are interested in is the so-called well stream mixture because we will either believe or think or, or maybe know that that that's kind of representing what's actually coming in from the reservoir. Okay? So the, the reservoir fluid may be, of course it might be a little bit different than the well stream mixture. But at least um, that's going to be the assumption. So what our, our real purpose of this is to get a well stream mixture and to do that we have to physically recombine these two samples together. Okay, So these have to be in the lab physically recombined. And to do that correct recombination, you need to know the correct proportion of gas to add to the oil, right? And that proportion is basically coming from this term here. So the laboratory will ask you for this number, and it's your responsibility to give them the correct number. I'm just going to put something here. It's a beware. The real life is that the testing company who reports these gas rates and oil rates, okay, Schlumberger, Halliburton, you know, Weatherford, the company who's being paid to make the metering continuous every 15 minutes, maybe every 15 seconds for all I know, at least every so often, fairly frequently. They'll give you this long spreadsheet and then you'll give a bigger report. And the spreadsheet's got hundreds, probably many thousands of these points because it's all digitized. And they're going to give you a gas rate in standard volumes and then they're going to give you what they call oil rate. Okay? So, the test company report, and that typically is in an Excel sheet, often converts the metered separator barrels per day, the separator volume per day, to a, an estimated stock tank barrels per day. Okay. They often convert the physically measured QOSEP, and I'm just going to use SEP barrels per day, into a stock tank oil rate. Which I'll write Q O. This is going to be from the tester. T for testers. How do they do that? That you have to know. 
And the only way you're going to find that out, because it's not in any textbook, it's not in any publication. And you'll be lucky if the testing company, you can get somebody on the phone or an email who can actually tell you how they're doing it. So it's like right here and now is the only time you're going to get it. Okay? So how is this conversion made? And is it made? Okay? Because I can almost guarantee you that column will say oil rate, barrels per day. That's it. Oil rate, barrels per day. Now a lot of us have been screaming about this for so many years. Some of the test reports you actually see stock tank barrels per day. But you know that's a computer program. Maybe the guy just went in and typed it and maybe it's not always that way. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. So the problem is that you don't know whether it is QOSEP or QO stock tank being reported. And don't trust the header. Do not trust the header. You have to get a hold of someone who is competent within that company to guarantee you that it is separator barrels per day or stock tank barrels per day. Okay? So you Huh? You sell stock tank barrels. You, they think you're do they think they're doing you a favor. But they're not. Okay, so solution gas? Yeah. That's the, from the separator oil? Yeah. It's, it, they don't do anything there. But the point is that you, and the difference between the separator oil volume and the stock tank oil volume, it may be 2% different. You can say, okay, who cares? Or it can be 30% different. And remember your salary? If I just kind of drop 30% off arbitrarily, you know? You got to pay this guy's salary some way, slumber day, if you got to work for them, okay? No, you're going to recognize that you're not being paid that 30%. You'll probably recognize you're not being paid 2%. But that's the magnitude of difference between separator oil rate and stock tank oil rate. Shrinkage. It can be anywhere from 2% different to as much as 30% different. Okay? So you have to ask the testing company, not your boss, And you have to ask someone who's competent in the testing company. Now, how you figure that out, it's up to you. You might want to get the same answer from three people. You have to ask the testing company. Now, if they're reporting this number here, then you need to ask for the conversion factor, the shrinkage factor, the test shrinkage factor, SF tester, is defined by QO to QO sep. You have to ask for that test that is used, okay? And what you can tell them, you, they'll know. If they know what they're talking about, they're going to say, okay, well, it's in the test report. That's what they, this clever lady engineer is going to tell you. It's in the test report. And she's probably right. But the test report is like 98 pages with lots and lots of numbers. And it's over in the comment line. There's not a column for it. It's just interspersed in amongst all the other comments. Shrinkage factor test. They actually do a measurement, kind of not a very good one. But what you'll find is that the shrinkage factor that they use in the testing company, it'll be me measured here. This is, uh, you know, one. I'm going to put 0.8. They'll measure it here, and then they will assume it's constant until they make another measure. Soon it's constant, and they'll make another measurement.
Okay? You need that table. And make them give you that table. Okay? After all, you paid them bukus of money to do the test report. Have them give this to you. That means all of these rates that they were metering between this time and this time were converted with this factor. Doesn't mean that that's physically the correct factor. And in reality, there's a big error bar because the measurement is not very accurate that they do in the field. Okay? So the uncertainty is here. The real, true physical shrinkage factor if you were in a perfect world and could measure it, it might look something like this. Okay? What's that? Red? Okay, but we don't, we don't know the purple. We have no idea what the purple is. Nobody knows. I'm just saying that this is reality. In other words, if you really wanted the stock tank barrels being produced, you would have to know that curve, but no one knows this. What they do is in the field, they'll make a measurement, and instead of getting this value, they got that value. Instead of using this value, they measured this value. Instead of measuring this value, they got that value. Okay? Because the measurement in the field is not that accurate. Plus the fact that, in reality, it may not be constant at all. Because this thing here is a strong function of the separator temperature and the separator pressure. So if those are changing continuously, or in step changes, then, but what you need to know is basically they're giving me stock tank, their stock tank barrels. So, for example, if the samples were collected here, the samples were collected here. It's not a good example because they're pretty close here. They're going to be using this shrinkage factor and it. And that's the shrinkage factor you want to convert back to separator barrels. So you want to use, this is the value that they were using at this time. Okay. So if they report this, we ask for that. We find it. It's this one here. Then we have to take and calculate the separator oil rate from the test reported rate and divide it by the shrinkage factor used during the test. It's this value that the PVT lab needs. To do the recombination, the physical recombination. I'm going to make this kind of a light gray because we don't know it. It's there, but nobody knows it. Okay. Now, why they don't just report the separator rate, I, you know, I don't know. But, okay, they don't. So that's a typical correction that's important and it usually needs to be made to come up with the 
the actual uh, separator rate needed here. In addition, the, the, the PVT laboratory themselves will do a slight correction. I'm just going to put T for test here. Okay. The laboratory themselves will do a slight correction to that test gas rate. Okay. So I'll just make uh, so the lab will correct, and it's usually only slightly. It's only a change, typically you know, less than 1%, maybe to as much as 5%, but that's very uncommon. Um, of the gas rate reported during the test, standard cubic feet per day, standard cubic meters per day. And what they're correcting is that in the gas meter equation, in the gas meter conversion between the pressure drop and mass rate, it has the Z factor of the gas and it has the molecular weight of the gas flowing. And in the field, they don't really know the Z factor of that gas, of that separator gas, and they don't really know its molecular weight. So you have test values out in the field, these are approximate. Okay, when the lab receives this separator gas sample, they will measure the Z factor and the molecular weight of the gas. Okay, so the lab will measure these two. Okay, and then using these, they know that this rate was based on these two numbers, they can correct the gas metering number uh, using the laboratory data. And it's not a big number because I think it's, it's the ratio of Z factors square root and the ratio of molecular weight square root. I, I, I don't remember the, the correction terms, but it's usually not a very big uh, correction. So that'll give a corrected separator gas rate. So then the lab will recombine using the corrected separator gas rate and the correct may be corrected or it just may be the reported. The correct, I'll just write both of these correct, gas and oil rate ratio. Okay. And they'll make the recombinations with those. This is often called gas oil ratio is a capital um, capital R for gas oil ratio. So some I think in the book it's written as capital R S P for separator gas rate. Right? Gas oil ratio. Any questions? So that is what's called separator sampling. Uh, you, you collect a separator gas sample and a separator oil sample. Now, before we finish this discussion of the separator sampling, there are two laboratory quality control uh, measurements made when they receive the lab. So the lab makes two QC tests of the sample bottles. The first one is on the separator gas. I'm going to draw my funky 
bottle. Okay. And then there's a basically a valve here. And a pressure gauge. Okay. So what they'll do is that they will heat the bottle. to separator temperature. Okay. Hopefully they'll shake it a little bit. I don't know if they do or not. And once it's heated up to separator temperature, then they will open the valve. And then they'll check Mysterious ways, right? Any, any of you guys watch this uh, uh, this uh, magician guy who's on one of the Discovery Channel or something? I don't know what his name is, but he's huh? Yeah, I mean this guy's incredible. My son watches him, and he comes, he has me come in, and I just think it's all orchestrated in Hollywood. But apparently, he's he's doing stuff that's uh, let's see. It says quit. I'm not sure what to do here. Um, I say don't quit. Screen breaks. Um, left screen. Down, down. But it's not projecting, so I'm not sure whether anything's going to work. I think I have to quit and restart it. Sorry. So, um, one of you guys is out there is practicing their magic, right? You know, uh, Curtis is going to teach him. So. So anyway, the, uh, the laboratory heats up the separator gas bottle. And then they put the pressure gauge on it. And when they open the valve, what should the pressure be? They fill the tank, they fill the bottle right at the separator, right? And right at the separator, the temperature should be the separator temperature, pressure. So when you bring that bottle to the laboratory, and you heat the bottle to the same temperature, what should the pressure be? The separator pressure. If there has been leakage during transport, what's the pressure going to be? If it's been leaking stuff, the pressure is going to be lower, probably. So basically, they call this the opening pressure. And that should be approximately equal to the separator pressure at the time of sampling. Well, how close, you know, I don't, I, I can't tell you a, a number. I don't think anybody can tell you a number. I guess, I guess if it was more than, more than 10% low, I might be worried about some leakage, very slow leakage. But, um, you know, certainly within 10%, it, it's probably okay. Deviation. Then you have to ask questions. Do you want to use the sample if it has a bigger deviation than 10%? And of course, if the pressure is higher than the separator pressure, that's kind of weird. Okay, then I'm not sure what to think on that. But usually it would be less than because of leakage. So basically, we're looking to identify possible leakage during transport. Okay. 
So then the second test they do is for the separator oil. Okay. And here they actually measure, they kind of do a mini uh, test. They've got this separator oil container. I think it often has a piston in it, something like that. Here's our oil. Okay. And they should bring it to the separator pressure. I'm sorry, the separator temperature in the lab. And then they'll measure volume in the cylinder versus pressure. They go to very high pressure first. They'll start down here. And then they'll lower the pressure. Volume will get slightly bigger, not a lot. And then it'll do a couple of these. And basically what's going on here is that you've gone such a low pressure that you're getting gas out of solution, whereas here it's single phase oil. And kind of where those two trends meet is the bubble point pressure okay, of that oil that you've collected. It's a fairly simple, simple test. You don't need so many points. That Now, that oil was taken out of the separator, right? The separator contains oil and gas, right? Anytime you have a fluid system that has oil and gas together, the oil is what we call saturated. It is saturated with what? With the separator gas. That oil is at its bubble point. Okay, so if you have a two-phase system anywhere, then the oil will be saturated with the gas it's in equilibrium with, and that oil will be at its bubble point. The gas in that container will be saturated gas, saturated with what? With the oil it's in equilibrium with, and the gas will be at its dew point pressure. Okay. So, when we do this experiment, the pressure, the bubble point pressure they find of this at separator temperature should be equal to what? The separator pressure. Okay? That oil should be saturated at separator temperature. If the measured bubble point is considerably lower than the separator pressure, it means something's been leaking out, gas probably. Okay? So you've had some kind of leakage. So that's the QC for the oil. This is the QC for the gas. And, <clears throat> yeah. I think that concludes basically the issues around separator sampling. So you see there are many more, call it issues if you will, uh, things you have to know to use uh, separator samples uh, properly to make sure that the separator samples that are collected are valid, um, there has been no leakage. Um, any Any questions? Purpose is to get the recombined well stream composition, not composition, but fluid sample. That's what we want to do. We want to recombine to find out what's here, what entered the separator, under the assumption that it may be actually the same fluid that's entering, you know, the, well, it is the same fluid that's probably entering the, the, the reservoir here. And hopefully that well stream is approximately representative of what's in the reservoir. Maybe, maybe not.
The separator sampling can be used both for reservoir oils and gas condensates. So that's a okay for basically reservoir oils and gas condensates. Pretty much any pretty much any fluid system that has um, measurable surface con liquids at the surface. I mean if you have you know if, if you're basically if you're metering during the testing if your oil rate is you know stabilized your typically your your gas rate should you know, should also be maybe decreasing a little bit should be kind of stabilized like that if you have that kind of performance even if this oil rate is very low three barrels per day or you know 18 barrels per day if you have stable oil production then this method can be used okay um, so just as an example, let's say that this is on the order of 1 million standard cubic feet per day. That would be good right in Oklahoma or Texas or something. In the North Sea, it might be 10 to 50 million standard cubic feet per day. Okay. But so this would, let's say, offshore, onshore type. Well, the oil rates here onshore might be as little as. Um, you know, five barrels to well five thousand barrels per day offshore you, you typically would have uh, oil rates that were maybe as low as 50, but might be as much as 5,000 plus offshore stock tank barrels per day. So even if you're in this low range here, if you have stabilized rate being metered, then you can use this method. Basically, the main thing is that this needs to be more or less stabilized. Not stabilized would mean slugs. Okay, if you had slugs, you know, you you, you might have. that that wouldn't work very well that would be a slug flow okay you have so little liquid it's becoming two phases of the tubing it's accumulating you're getting a slug of liquid and then it comes out all of a sudden and then you get no more liquid for another three hours so that that would not be um, that would be unstabilized flow okay so we'll take a break and then um, Come back and talk about what do we do with these samples that we've collected.